Welcome back to Human Physiology with Dr. Piri. So today we are looking at the circulatory system. So in this class, we'll discuss blood pressure. So we started looking at circulatory system way back. So, so far we've discussed a number of lectures. So today we'll be discussing lecture six of the circulatory system. So like I said, basically we'll be discussing the blood pressure. So this blood pressure, there are different aspects of blood pressure that we're going to look at today. So in simple terms, we're going to discuss the blood pressure, general information about blood pressure. Then we'll also discuss blood pressure measurements. So there are different devices that you can use to measure blood pressure. Then we're also going to discuss blood pressure regulation. So the mechanisms that are involved in regulating the blood pressure. Then at the end, we'll discuss hypotension and hypertension. So without wasting much of the time, so let's start. So you know to say that blood pressure is very important aspect of the circulatory system because this blood pressure is the one that is maintaining blood perfusion to the tissues. So uh, you need to have this blood pressure to maintain blood flow to the tissues or blood perfusion to the tissues. Otherwise, if the tissues are not receiving this blood, it means there's no oxygen that is transported to the tissues. There's no, uh, there's no transportation of nutrients. So the cells can start dying. So that's why it's very important to, to regulate the blood pressure within the normal range. So at the end of this class, you should be able to describe blood pressure and also measurements of blood pressure, regulation of blood pressure. And you should be able to, to also discuss some disorders associated with blood pressure. We're talking of hypertension, low blood pressure, and hypertension, increased blood pressure. So how can you define blood pressure? So this is where we're starting from. So let's look at just the general information about blood pressure. So in simple terms, what is blood pressure? So you know to say when the, the heart is contracting, is ejecting blood into the aorta. And that is going to create a pressure in the arteries. So that pressure in the arteries, so the pressure that is exerted by blood against the walls of the cardiovascular system is referred to as blood pressure. That pressure is the force that blood exerts against blood vessel walls. And you know to say, this is due to the pumping action of the heart. So the pumping action of the heart is the one that is injecting blood into the arteries to create the blood pressure. So why are you taking this blood pressure? It's because by taking the blood pressure, you'll be able to assess the state in which the circulatory system is in terms of the function of the circulatory system. So measuring the blood pressure is an accurate and simple method of assessing the state of the circulatory system. So if you want to assess the circulatory system of the patient, you need to take the blood pressure. So it will give you an idea on how the circulatory system is operating within the patient or a person <clears throat> in which you are measuring the blood pressure. So there are two types of blood pressure. You can have the maximum blood pressure or the minimum blood pressure. So the maximum blood pressure, you'll be able to take it during systole when the heart is contracting to eject blood into the aorta. So that maximum pressure that is created by the blood against the blood vessel walls is called systolic blood pressure. Systolic blood pressure is the maximum pressure exerted by the blood against the artery walls. So you're going to measure this during systole when the heart is contracting and the aortic semilunar valves are open at this point, you know, to say for this blood to be ejected into the aorta or the pulmonary trunk, the semilunar valves needs to be open. So we have the aortic semilunar valve and the pulmonary semilunar valves that needs to be open for you to get the maximum pressure within the arterial system. And <clears throat> you know what to say is as a result of the contraction of the ventricles. Under normal circumstances, the range, the normal range of systolic blood pressure or the maximum blood pressure that you can get in the arterial system is about or it's around 120 millimeter of mercury. So sometimes you can have an increase or a decrease. <clears throat> so this is just the normal value. So some people will have systolic blood pressure of less than 120, maybe to be 
around 1, 115, 118, some will be slightly higher than this, which is also considered within the normal range. Then the lowest pressure in the arteries is referred to as the stoic pressure. And this is taking place during the relaxation of the heart. So during diastole, when the heart is relaxing, you are going to get the lowest pressure in the arteries. So this lowest pressure is referred to as diastolic pressure, which is around 8 mm of mercury. So the highest pressure, systolic pressure, 120. The lowest pressure <clears throat> during diastole is 80. So blood pressure sometimes is expressed as systolic pressure over diastolic pressure. In this case, it would be 120 over 80 millimeter of mercury, which is normal on average when you're looking at an adult man. Then there's also mean arterial pressure. So the mean arterial pressure is just the average pressure in an individual during a single cardiac cycle. So when you take the average pressure during systole and diastole in the arteries, that is called mean arterial pressure. So when you're looking at all the arteries, then you take the average of that pressure in the arteries. That is the mean arterial pressure. On average, it's around 100. So between 90 and 100 is acceptable. So that's the mean arterial pressure. So the clinical significance of the mean arterial pressure is considered as the perfusion pressure seen by the organs. So you're talking of the pressure that is going to facilitate perfusion of blood into the organs. So once you have a decrease in the mean arterial pressure, even the perfusion of blood to the organs will also reduce. So that can also result into maybe hypoxia or lack of oxygen and also reduce amount of nutrients that are transported to the tissues <clears throat> that will bring about necrosis of the cells. Then there is mean systemic pressure, which is different from mean arterial pressure. The mean systemic pressure, you are talking of the average pressure in the cardiovascular system. So here you're looking at the arteries, the capillaries, and the veins. So the entire cardiovascular system, what is the average pressure? So the average pressure of the cardiovascular system is also referred to as mean systemic pressure, which is around 6.5. So this mean systemic pressure, it doesn't include the pulmonary pressure. So it's just the systemic pressure, the mean systemic pressure, that is around 6.5 millimeter of mercury. So it's going to determine the venous return. It's going to determine the blood that is returning back to the heart. So that's the mean systemic pressure. This diagram is also called the Wiggins diagram. So the Wiggins diagram, we discussed this in the previous lecture. So I'm not going to waste much time here. But I just want you to appreciate the aortic pressure in this diagram. So you know to say you have pressure that is plotted against time. In this time you have the cardiac cycle that is divided into seven phases. Phase one, atrial system, when the atria is contracting. Phase two is called isovolumetric ventricular contraction. Three, it's called rapid ejection or rapid ventricular ejection. Four, reduced ventricular ejection. Five, isovolumetric ventricular relaxation. Six, you have rapid ventricular feeding. Seven, reduced ventricular feeding. So these stages of the cardiac cycle is plotted against the pressure in the aorta, in the atria, in the ventricle. So the one I'm interested in here is the aortic pressure because this is the same pressure that is transmitted to the arterial system. Remember, the aorta is the first artery from the heart. So the 
aortic pressure will be transmitted to the arterial system. So you can see here that there is a decrease in pressure when the ventricles are relaxing. So the aortic pressure is decreasing, but you will see that during the contraction of the ventricles, there's a time when the aortic pressure will start increasing. That time is where there is the opening of the aortic valves. You know, during isovolumetric contraction, the AV valves and the semilunar valves are both closed. So there is no change in the volume of blood that is found within the ventricles when the ventricles are contracting but there is, a, there is an increase in the ventricular pressure. So as the ventricular pressure is increasing, but the volume is constant, so you can see the volume here is constant in the ventricles, but the pressure is increasing. When this pressure is increasing, it's going to force the opening of the aortic valves. So these aortic valves or the semilunar valves are going to open due to the pressure that is mounting within the ventricles. When they open, now you have the ejection period whereby blood is ejected into the aorta. As blood is being ejected into the aorta, the aortic pressure will also increase because the amount of blood that is ejected here is increasing. So blood is moving from the left ventricle into the aorta. That will result into an increase in aortic pressure to such a time whereby the contraction is now reducing, then the ventricular pressure is reducing, you can see, and also the aortic pressure will start reducing. But to reach a time whereby the aorta, after expanding because of ejection of blood, is going to recall. So as the aorta is recalling back to the normal lumen, you find that it's also going to create pressure within the aorta. So as the ventricular pressure is reducing, the aortic pressure is going to be maintained because of the recording of the blood vessels. So you can see here, because, because of that recording of blood vessels, it's going to create, or it's going to maintain the aortic pressure. But because now there's too much pressure in the aorta as compared to the ventricles, blood would want to backflow back into the ventricles. But that is going to be prevented by the closure of the aortic valves. So you have aortic valve closes here. That is going to prevent the backflow of blood. So it's going to create the diacrotic notch. So you can appreciate the notch within the aortic pressure here. Then the pressure will be maintained later on by the total peripheral resistance. I'm going to explain how the total peripheral resistance is going to maintain the diastolic pressure in the aorta. When the ventricles are relaxing and the ventricular pressure is reducing to almost zero, but the pressure within the aorta is maintained to about eight millimeter of mercury, which is the lowest pressure in the arteries. The highest pressure you can see here is about 120. So the highest pressure, the lowest pressure is maintained because of the coring of the aorta or the arteries and also the total peripheral resistance that is created by the smaller arteries and the arterioles. So <clears throat> this same diagram is the same when you start looking at the aortic pressure now because this pressure, aortic pressure is created due to I mean, the arterial pressure is created due to aortic pressure. Remember, the pressure is starting from the ventricles into the aorta, then into the arterial system. So it will, be, it will have the same shape. So you can see here that during systo, the aortic pressure is increasing. Then when it reaches the maximum, you have the systolic pressure. Then later on, the muscles now will start relaxing. Then you have diastolic phase whereby the pressure will start reducing, but it won't reduce to zero. Why? It's because this, the aortic valve are going to close, creating this necrotic notch, because blood would want to go into the ventricles, but to be prevented by the closure 
of the aortic valves. So when they close here, the pressure will be maintained now. Then you have the diastolic pressure, which is the lowest pressure. It doesn't go to zero because it will be maintained by the recording of the arterial wall and also by the resistance of certain arteries, the smaller arteries. <clears throat> the difference between the systolic pressure and the diastolic pressure is called the pulse pressure. So this pulse pressure is the difference between the systolic pressure and the diastolic pressure. It's also a very good indicator of the cardiovascular system in terms of how it's working. So under normal circumstances, the pulse pressure should be around 40 and 50, not more than 50, not less than 50. So in an individual, if you have pulse pressure that is more than 50, then such an individual will be more prone to other diseases. So this pulse pressure needs to be between 40 and 50 somewhere there. <clears throat> okay, so like I said, the pulse pressure is the systolic pressure minus the diastolic pressure. So in this example, you can see that the highest pressure here is around 125. So this will be your systolic pressure. The lowest pressure here is around 85. So if you say one, 25 minus 85, it will give you 40 millimeter of mercury, which is normal. So you want to have such pulse pressure. Otherwise, if it's greater than that, or it's greater than 50, or it's far less than 40, then you have trouble <clears throat> with this patient. So this diagram is just showing us the pressure profile of the circulatory system. So which vessels are going to resist the flow of blood or are going to reduce the pressure? So you can see here, starting from the aorta, going to the large arteries, you have the small arteries, arterioles. So within the aorta and the large arteries, you can see that the pressures are high here. So the arterial pressures are high. Or you can see that <clears throat> the systemic pressure and the stoic pressure is maintained within. 120 and 80. But later on, as you go to smaller arteries, so these small arteries and arterioles, you can see here that the pressure is reducing so much. Why? It's because the diameter or the lumen of these arteries are smaller. So they're going to restrict the blood flow. So restriction of this blood flow will create this resistance. So you can see that blood pressure will start reducing from the small arteries to the arterioles to the extent that when you approach, you are approaching the capillaries and the venues, the pressure will almost reach zero, but it's not zero, just slightly above zero here. Because you know to say you have that mean systemic pressure that will maintain the venous retain. So you can see <clears throat> this pressure is maintained because of the mean systemic pressure that will maintain the venous return to the heart by the vena cava. Then after that, blood will be pumped by the right ventricle into the pulmonary arteries. And then you can see here the pressure has increased because now it's from the heart, so the heart is somewhere here. Then after that, the blood will return to the heart and then the left ventricle will pump into the aorta with a greater force. And then you have this systolic pressure <clears throat> and the pressure when the heart is relaxing is diastolic pressure. So when you're taking pressure, um, pressure or BP measurement or blood pressure measurement, it's taking place within the large arteries. So that's why you will need your blood pressure measurement to be between 120 and 80 on average, which is normal. So anything outside this range, you find that you have hypertension if you have an increase or hypotension if you have a decrease. So look at that towards the end, but you just need to know that of the arteries, the small arteries in the arterioles will provide the greatest resistance to the blood flow. And such a question comes in MCQs, so you need to pay attention. <clears throat> so we proceed by looking at blood pressure measurement. So what can you use to measure blood pressure? So there are two methods. You can have evasive 
and non-invasive. So invasive, these uh, whereby you use pressure catheter or transducer, so it's invasive, which is not good for a patient because it involves cutting and insertion of these catheter and transducers. So mainly the invasive is very accurate and it can provide central pressure waveforms. So it can give you central pressure. You're talking of the pressure in those large arteries that are closer to the heart because this is where you put your transducer or your catheter. So it's very accurate, but it's invasive. So it's not very good for the patient. So under normal circumstances, it's not used in hospitals to take that pressure of patients because you know the risk factor there mainly it can result in two thrombosis and also cardiac arrhythmias. So you don't want arrhythmias, you don't want thrombosis. So it's not being used. In most cases, the invasive way of taking blood pressure is used in experiments or, or a research. So it could be an experiment or a study that you want to, to measure blood pressure. So you want the accurate blood pressure. You can use the invasive. Under normal circumstances in hospitals, we normally use non-invasive methods. This is where we have the sphygmomanometer. So the sphygmomanometer is a device that is used to measure blood pressure. So it's non-invasive. So it means it's, it's friendly to the patient and also, <clears throat> and also to the doctors or the nurses that are taking the blood pressure. So the sphygmomanometer, you have different types of sphygmomanometer. You can use the auscultation, whereby you need to listen to the sounds that can be produced within the blood vessels due to turbulence flow of blood. I'll explain how that can be done. So you need um, a sphygmomanometer, and then you also need your stethoscope to listen to the, to the sounds. Then you also have the oscillo oscillometry, the oscillometry, these are just more like automatic sphygmomanometer, whereby you just connect the calf and then you'll be able to take the blood pressure automatically. So it comes in handy. Then there are also other sphygmomanometer or other forms of devices that you can use to take blood pressure. For instance, you have volume cramp. A volume cramp is whereby you constrict blood vessels of the fingers or the arteries of the fingers, then it will be able to take the blood pressure. Then you can also use tonometry. Tonometry, is, it's, a, it's a transducer that you can also use to take blood pressure. So these are non-invasive, so you can use them to take blood pressure in patients. So in most cases, we normally use the sphygmomanometer. The advantages and the drawbacks of using this non-invasive <coughs> is Mainly it's quick, cheap, and it's widely used because you know it's cheap and very quick as compared to the invasive ones whereby you need to, to insert catheters, transducers that will take time. Then the disadvantages mainly is due to lack of central pressure measurement. So it's not going to give you the central pressure measurements. So mainly you're just measuring the peripheral blood pressure, the, the break your blood blood pressure in most cases we use the the brachial artery so you're going to to get the the brachial blood blood pressure and then it also requires skilled and experienced operators so you need somebody with the skill to measure the blood pressure otherwise you you won't get accurate results for instance if you're using the mercury manometer, you need to listen to the cord uh of sounds so if you don't know how these sounds <clears throat> come about, sometimes you can miss the blood pressure and then you can have the wrong recordings or it will bring some errors in your recording. So these are different types of sphygmomanometer that are used to take blood pressure. So we have the aneroid sphygmomanometer, then we have the mercury sphygmomanometer, then there is the digital sphygmomanometer. So the one which is recommended is the mercury sphygmomanometer. But you know mercury is dangerous. So sometimes you find that when they, they break, then you are exposed to mercury, it can bring other issues. So nowadays you find that most people, they just normally use 
the digital sphygmomanometer. The aneroid sphygmomanometer, you have the pressure gauge as opposed to the mercury bar here. So the mechanism is almost identical, but instead of using the mercury, you have the pressure gauge. But you also have the calf here, and also in the mercury sphygmomanometer, you also have a calf which you insert in the arm on the brachial artery for you to measure the blood pressure. Then the digital ones, they also have a calf. So you have this calf that you put on the arm, then it will be able, <clears throat> once you, you inflate the calf, it will be able to give you the blood pressure. So you can see here, it will give you the, the systolic blood pressure and the diastolic blood pressure, it also give you the pulse rate. So it will give you more like the heart rate because we said the heart rate is almost equivalent to the pulse rate in terms of their values. But sometimes you can have a dropped pulse rate when you have a weaker contraction of the ventricles. So I hope you remember that. <clears throat> so we proceed by looking at these different types of sphygmomanometer. So the first one you can see, you have the mercury sphygmomanometer. These are different uh, parts of the mercury sphygmomanometer. You can see there's a gauge here, the mercury gauge. Then you have the calf. Then you have the inflation bulb. This is what you use to inflate the calf to create pressure within the calf. Then you have a valve here. So that once you inflate the calf, you are able to reduce the calf pressure by opening the valve. Then you'll be able to measure the systolic and the diastolic, depending on when you hear those colloquial sounds that I'll be explaining. Then this is the aneroid <clears throat> sphygmomanometer. You can see you have the pressure gauge. Then you also have the calf that you the, the calf that you connect or you put on the arm of the patient. Then on the other end, you have the digital sphygmomanometer. So these will give you the systolic, diastolic, and also the pulse. The, the pulse. But when you're using the mercury sphygmomanometer and the aneroid sphygmomanometer, it's not going to give you the pulse. So you, you need to take pulse yourself. <clears throat> okay, so this is the mercury sphygmomanometer, which is mainly used. So we're going to do this in the lab, but for the sake of theory, I'm going to explain just within 10, five minutes so that you understand how this is used. So these notes you read on your own, I'll use this diagram to explain how it's done. So you can see the brachial artery here. So in this diagram, you have normal blood flow. Why is because the brachial artery is not constricted, it's not occluded. So you have the normal flow of blood and you know to say the normal flow of blood, it's laminar flow. So laminar flow of blood, it's quiet and smooth. So you, even if you put a stethoscope, the diaphragm or the stethoscope here trying to get some sounds, you won't get anything because laminar flow is quiet and smooth. When there is no occlusion of blood flow. But now when you want to use the sphygmomanometer, the mercury sphygmomanometer, you're going to apply the calf on the arm. But remember, before you take blood pressure, you need to make sure that the patient is comfortable, is not thinking about things, okay? Because those things can also interfere with your results or they can give you wrong results. For instance, if the patient is not seated in a proper way, if they are crossing their legs, Okay, if the, the arm is not supported, if they are fidgeting, they are moving about, so it can give you wrong blood pressure. So you need to make sure that the patient, they are comfortable, <clears throat> you talk to them in a normal way, they are relaxed so that you get the accurate results. So you're going to apply your calf, then you're going to use your bulb to inflate the calf. So there are two pressures here that I want you to understand. 
there is a pressure that is created within the curve, then there is also blood pressure that is found within the blood vessels. So this blood vessel we are looking at is the brachial artery. <clears throat> so during normal flow, you have normal blood pressure that is pushing blood to move within the brachial artery. But when you apply your calf, then you inflate your calf so much that the calf pressure becomes more than the brachial pressure, uh, the brachial artery pressure. So once the calf pressure <clears throat> inside the calf here is greater than the brachial artery pressure, it means that you are going to occlude the flow of blood because the brachial artery is going to be constricted or occluded. So you can see in this diagram here that there is occlusion of the brachial artery, then the cessation of blood flow. So blood is not flowing to the arm. Why is because you have, or to the hand, because you've occluded the brachial artery. So now what you need to know, you need now to start releasing the pressure within the calf. So you have that pressure valve that you can start opening to release the pressure within the calf. As you start releasing the pressure in the calf, you need to place your stethoscope, then you start listening to the sounds. So as you are releasing the pressure within the calf, it will reach a time whereby the pressure in the calf will be almost the same as the pressure in the brachial artery. When that happens, then the systolic pressure becomes greater than the calf pressure. It means that the brachial artery, which was occluded, it will start opening up because of the blood that is pushing here. And this pressure within the brachial artery is now greater than the pressure in the calf. So you're going to have spatting of blood through the brachial artery. So this spatting of blood through the brachial artery, it will result into the production of sounds as a result of turbulence flow. So turbulent flow of blood will produce sounds which are called of sound. So the moment the brachial pressure, the brachial artery pressure is greater than the calf pressure, there will be blood that will be spurting through here. And then it will be producing cortical of sounds because of turbulence flow of blood. So the moment you hear the cortical of sounds, you record that as your systolic blood pressure. So this will be the highest blood pressure. Then you continue listening to the cortical sounds. <clears throat> so these cortical sounds, they're divided into phases, phase one, two, three, four, and five. So the moment the brachial pressure is far greater than the calf pressure, or the moment the calf pressure has reduced so much that it's less than the diastolic pressure. It means that even during diastole, blood is still moving. So because the diastolic pressure now is greater than the calf pressure, you find that the blood will go back to the normal laminar flow of blood, which is quiet and doesn't produce sound when you compare it to turbulent flow. So once the brachial pressure, the diastolic pressure in the brachial artery is greater than the calf pressure, then it goes back to the normal laminar flow where you won't get any sounds. So the moment you don't hear any sounds, then you record that as your diastolic volume. So the moment you hear the sounds or the cortical of sounds, you record that as your systolic pressure. So during systole, there will be movement of blood. During diastole, blood won't be moving until such a time whereby the, the brachial pressure is now the diastolic pressure, which is greater than the calf pressure. Then you have continuous flow of blood. Then you won't get any sounds because it goes back to the laminar flow. <clears throat> 
then you record that as diastolic volume. So these sounds are called cortical sounds that you listen using the stethoscope. So you have the five phases of the cortical sounds. So you have phase one, whether whereby you have the brachial pressure is greater than the calf pressure, and then you have spatting of blood moving into the brachial artery. Then you have these sounds because of the flow, it's turbulence flow. Then it will produce these cloud cough sounds. So these cloud cough sounds, the first one that you're going to hear, once you hear the first one, then you record that as your systolic pressure or your maximum pressure. So these in phase one, they will be sharp, third sounds. Then later on, they'll become like blowing or sweeping sound. That is phase two. Then after that, you're going to hear a softer third than phase one. So here they are softer in third than phase one, like the ones that you had in phase one, uh, the ones that you had in phase one. So this is phase three. And then after that, they'll even become softer blowing sounds that disappears. So here now in phase four, they'll start disappearing until phase five, which is silent. So if you stop hearing those protocol sounds, you record that as your diastolic pressure. So you need to know. So you can only do this if you are an experienced individual. That's why I say that one of the disadvantages is because you need somebody who's experienced for you to take the blood pressure using the mercury manometer. But don't worry, we'll do this in the lab and then you'll be able to to learn how to take pressure using sigma manometer. But there's also, there's also a small simulation of how the sounds come about. So you can play this uh, small video. So it will give you an idea on how the sounds will be produced. So you can hear the code of sounds and then later on they will stop. So the moment you hear the code of of sounds here, you record it as diastolic pressure. Then the moment they stop, then that will be your, I mean, the moment you hear the sounds, that will be your systolic pressure. The moment that the sounds stop, that will be your diastolic pressure. And this pressure, you record, you will see it within the mercury bar here. So the systolic pressure and diastolic pressure. Okay, enough for this, let's just proceed. <clears throat> Mean arterial pressure. So mean arterial pressure is just like the average of the arterial pressure. So all the pressure in the arterial system. So if you get the average of that, that would be your mean arterial pressure. So there's a formula in which you can calculate the mean arterial pressure. So you know to say that this pressure uh, you, you are recording is during systole and diastole. Remember the cardiac cycle is divided into systole and diastole. So remember that their heart spend more time relaxing than contracting. So the systole or the contraction of the heart is just the first 0 0.3 seconds. So the first 0 0.3 seconds, that would be your systole or your contraction. Then the last seconds from 0 0.3 to 0 0.5, about 0, point, about 0 0.5 seconds, the heart will be relaxing. So one third of the cardiac cycle is contraction to the systole, and two thirds of the cardiac cycle is diastole when the heart is relaxing. So your mean arterial pressure is one third of systolic pressure plus the two third of diastolic pressure. So you're taking the average of systole and diastole, but you need to know that the heart spend more time relaxing than contracting. So if you divide the cardiac cycle into three, you need to understand this. Sometimes it can be confusing, confusing when you are looking at the mean arterial pressure. So what I'm saying is, if this is the cardiac cycle, so you have systole here, then you have diastole here. So I said systole is one third of the cardiac cycle in terms of time, 
So from zero to three, then from zero point, I mean, from zero to 0 0.3 second, then from 0 0.3 to 0 0.8, you have diastole, which is equivalent to about 0 0.5 seconds. 0 0.5 seconds. So the heart is spending more time in diastole than in systole. So if you divide the cardiac cycle into three equal parts, you realize to say that you only have one part, which is systole, but you have two parts, which are diastole. So you can see the two parts here. So you have this part and this part. So if this is your two and three. So if you're taking the average of this pressure, it means that you're going to get this pressure plus this pressure you divide by one, two, three. So if you say your mean arterial pressure will be equal to, there's only one part of systole. So you have one part of systolic pressure. Then you add the two parts of diastole. So you have two parts of diastole in terms of duration. So if you divide this by three, you're, get, you're going to get your mean arterial pressure. So in other way, you can say the mean arterial pressure will be equal to one third of systole plus two over three, two thirds of diastole. So if you know systolic pressure, you know diastolic pressure, you'll be able to calculate your mean arterial pressure by taking one third of systole, adding to two thirds of diastole. That will be your, your mean arterial pressure. I hope you understand that. So we proceed. Then there's also another formula for mean arterial pressure here, which says diastolic pressure plus one third of pulse pressure. And if you remember, pulse pressure is the difference between the systolic pressure and diastolic pressure. So why is this equation also equal to mean arterial pressure? So what it means here is the same concept. So what it means here that mean arterial pressure is equal to diastolic pressure plus one third of pulse pressure. It means that when you're looking at the cardiac cycle, so if we say this is the pressure in the cardiac cycle, you have systole and diastole. So let's say systole is shown in green. So this is a systole pressure of which we say the systole, during systole, the pressure, the maximum pressure is 120. So 120 millimeter of mercury. So this would be 120 millimeter of mercury. Then the diastolic pressure mean is about 80, the minimum pressure. We said 80. So it's spending more time in diastole. So you have systole here, you have diastole here. In terms of time, this is zero, this is 0 0.3 seconds. Then this is your 0 0.8, your complete cardiac cycle. So we said two thirds of the time is spent in diastole then only one third is spent in system. So how do you get the average? So if you extend this pressure here, you will see that this will be your 80 millimeter of mercury, which is your diastolic pressure. So this is your systolic pressure 
this is your diastolic pressure. So if you get the difference between diastole and systole, so 120 minus 80, it will give you about 40. So the difference here, the pulse pressure is 40. So it means the pulse pressure is equal to 40 millimeter of mercury. So the difference here is 40. So what would be your mean arterial pressure? So your mean arterial pressure is as good as saying that this 140, you need to distribute it within the cardiac cycle. So remember, if you divide the cardiac cycle into three parts, one, two, three. So one third is systole and two thirds, this is diastole. So you need to divide the difference here by three. So if you say 40 divided by three, it will give you about 13 point something, so 13. So in other way, how can you calculate the mean arterial pressure? You will say the diastolic pressure, which is common for all, this diastolic pressure plus the pulse pressure divided by three. She's giving you this formula here, down here, which says the mean arterial pressure is the historic pressure plus one third of the pulse pressure. So if you add the 13 here, it means your mean arterial pressure will be somewhere around 93 millimeter of mercury. So this will be your, your mean arterial pressure. Because you are dividing this 40 into three parts. So you have 13 here and another 13 here and another 13 here. That will give you your mean arterial pressure. So this is how you can calculate mean arterial pressure. So you know how to calculate mean arterial pressure. You can use one third of systolic pressure plus two thirds of diastolic pressure. Then the other equation you can use diastolic pressure plus one third of pulse pressure. It will still give you your mean arterial pressure. But you also need to know that your mean arterial pressure can also be calculated as cardiac output multiplied by the total peripheral resistance. <clears throat> so the other equation for the mean arterial pressure, you know to say that the cardiac output is calculated as mean arterial pressure divided by the total peripheral resistance. So it means that the cardiac output is direct proportional to the mean arterial pressure, but it's inversely proportional to the total peripheral resistance. Because this is the, the, the pressure in which the heart has to pump against for it to eject blood into the aorta. So if you make the total peripheral resistance the subject of the formula or the mean arterial pressure as the subject of the formula, so you just cause multiply here, so it means that your mean arterial pressure will be equal to the cardiac output multiplied by the total peripheral resistance. So in a question, if I give you cardiac output, total peripheral resistance, you should be able to calculate the mean arterial pressure. If I give you the systolic pressure and diastolic pressure, you should also be able to calculate the mean arterial pressure and also to interpret the mean arterial pressure. Because I've told you to say, the mean arterial pressure is the one that will determine the perfusion pressure of blood into the organs. So if it's reducing or increasing, what will happen to the organs? Okay, so with that information, we proceed by looking at blood pressure regulation. So we'll discuss blood pressure regulation, and then the last part we'll just discuss um, disorders of blood pressure. You're talking about hypotension and hypertension, so let's start. So blood pressure regulation. So at the center here, you have blood pressure. So this blood pressure, you can measure the systolic blood pressure or the diastolic blood pressure. But the systolic blood pressure is mainly dependent on the cardiac output. Remember, we say the systolic blood pressure is the maximum blood pressure in the arteries. So the maximum force that the blood exits against the blood vessel walls is called the systolic blood pressure. 
So that is determined by the cardiac output. The, if you have an increase in the cardiac output, you're also going to have an increase in the systolic blood pressure. Because remember, the pressure that is coming from the ventricles is the one that is transmitted into the aorta, giving you the systolic blood pressure. So the systolic blood pressure is de dependent on the cardiac output mainly. And this cardiac output is affected by the stroke volume in the heart rate because the cardiac output is a product of the stroke volume in the heart rate. And there are factors that affect the heart rate. There are also other factors that affect the stroke volume. The major factors that we discussed that would affect the stroke volume is the preload, contractility, and the afterload. And which we said that afterload is one, is one way of expressing the total peripheral resistance. <clears throat> Then the contractility is the state of the myocardium, whether they are contracting with a greater force or a smaller force. Then the preload, you're looking at the other way of expressing the end diastolic volume or the end diastolic pressure. So if you have an increase in the end diastolic volume, it means you have an increase in preload, you're going to have an increase in stroke volume, you're going to have an increase in, in cardiac output, then the systolic pressure is going to increase. And this preload, <clears throat> is also affected by the venous return. So the venous return is the one that is going to give you the end diastolic volume. The venous return is also affected by other factors. You have the feeding pressure, depending on how much blood is retaining to the heart. So the venous return is affected by the feeding pressure. Then the feeding pressure is affected by the venomotor tone. If the, if the veins, they are constricting, you have venal constriction. So the compliance of the veins is reducing, you have more blood retaining to the heart. Then the end diastolic volume is going to increase. The preload is going to increase. The stroke volume is going to increase. The cardiac output is going to increase. The systolic blood pressure is also going to increase. Then the blood volume itself, if you have more blood volume, the venous return, of course, is going to increase. The preload is going to increase. The stroke volume is going to increase. Then the other factors that are affecting the venous return is the feeding time. So we're talking about also the heart rate will affect the feeding time because the, the feeling time is during the time when the heart is relaxing. So we said it spends more time in diastole as compared to systole. So that's the feeling time that will provide ample time for the venous return to produce more end diastolic volume, and then it will result into an increase in end diastolic pressure the preload is going to increase, the stroke volume is going to increase. And this feeding time is dependent on the historic interval, and the time when the heart is relaxing. On the other side, you have the total peripheral resistance. And we say the arteries that are providing greatest resistance to the blood flow, we say these are smaller arteries and the arterioles. So because they are small in terms of the diameter and then they have smooth muscles, when you have vessel constriction of the small arteries and the arterioles, the total peripheral resistance is increasing. So the workload on the heart is also going to increase. So we say that the diastolic volume is the one that is dependent on the total peripheral resistance. <clears throat> Because if the total peripheral resistance is increasing, it simply means that your diastolic volume is also going to increase. Why? It's because less of the blood is going to shift from the larger arteries to the smaller arteries. So you have more accumulation of blood within the larger arteries that will create more hydrostatic pressure. Hence, the diastolic volume is, and the diastolic pressure is also going to increase. So this diastolic pressure is dependent on the total peripheral resistance, which is affected by the vasoconstrictors and vasodilators. So you have vasoconstrictors factors and vasodilating factors. Then you also have the nerves, the sympathetics, parasympathetics. In most cases, are the sympathetics that will increase the resistance because the sympathetics, they will produce no epinephrine that will result in uh, constriction of the smaller arteries. You have constriction of the smaller arteries because you have contraction of smooth muscles when you have sympathetic stimulation. So these factors will have an effect 
on the systolic volume and systolic volume. And overall, they will have an effect on blood pressure. So this is very important for you to understand before we start discussing the actual mechanism involved in blood pressure regulation. So let's go and discuss blood pressure regulation. So regulation of blood pressure, there are different mechanisms that are involved. So you have hormonal mechanisms, then you have the hormonal mechanisms are called long-term mechanisms. Then you have neural mechanisms, which are short-term. Then you have auto-regulation mechanisms. So you have the short-term, which are neurological. In this case, mainly you're looking at the autonomic nervous system, the parasympathetic and the sympathetics that will have an effect on blood pressure. So they are involved in blood pressure regulation. Then you have long-term, these are hormonal, so many the hormonal or the hormones that we've been discussing is the renin and your tensin aldosterone axis, the rise. So the renin and your tensin aldosterone axis is also involved in blood pressure regulation. Then you have auto regulation or local regulation. Here you have two mechanisms. There is myogenic theory and metabolic theory. Myogenic, you are talking of the contractility of the smooth muscles. When smooth muscles are stretched due to pressure, they're going to contract to increase the resistance. Okay, so I'll explain that later on. Then you also have metabolic. You're talking about metabolites that can accumulate in these tissues. So some of these metabolites, they will act as vasodilators. So once they are accumulation of metabolites, they will result into dilatation of blood vessels. So we have auto regulation. So this auto regulation or local regulation of blood pressure, mainly it's regulating the blood flow to the organs. So let's go in detail <clears throat> to discuss each and every component of these mechanisms that are involved in regulation of blood pressure, starting with the short term regulation, which is very important when you are talking of regulation of blood pressure. So this is the function of the autonomic nervous system. And you know to say the autonomic nervous system, you have two pathways. There is a sympathetic pathway and the parasympathetic pathways. So the sympathetic pathways, they are important in control of circulation. Why is it? Because the sympathetic pathways, these sympathetic nerves, they innervate most of the blood vessels as compared to the parasympathetics that are mainly involved in regulating the heart function. So the parasympathetics, they don't necessarily innervate the blood vessels, but the sympathetics, they innervate the blood vessels. So the sympathetics, they are important in control of circulation. Then the parasympathetics, heart rate. So you need to know this difference. So as you know, the sympathetics or the sympathetic nerve fibers innervate all vessels except the capillaries and precapillaries, sphincters and some meta arterioles. So you can see that the sympathetics innervates most blood vessels, except for the capillaries, which are not innervated, and the pre-capillaries, sphincter muscles, and also the meta capillary or meta arterioles. They are not innervated, but the major part of the blood vessels are innervated by the sympathetics that will bring about vasoconstriction once you have sympathetic stimulation. Then the, the parasympathetics, they mainly innervate the SA node and the AV node. So they are involved in regulating the heart rate via the vagus nerve. So the cranial nerve number 10. So you find that the autonomic nervous system is involved in rapid regulation of blood pressure. So it will be the first mechanism that will kick in to regulate blood pressure. Before we talk of the auto regulation and also the long-term regulation that will involve hormones. It will take time for the body to produce hormones, to send signals for these hormones to be transported, to go and bind to the receptors. So it takes a bit time. That's why it's referred to as long-term regulation, as opposed to the autonomic nervous system, which is um, very fast. So the rapidity of response is very fast. Within seconds, then you have a response. 
So we'll discuss some of these. So you can see here the autonomic nervous system, the innervation. So even from this diagram, you can appreciate that the parasympathetics via the cranial nerve number 10, the vagus nerve, is mainly innervating the heart. So you can see the vagus nerve is innervating the heart, but it's not innervating most of the blood vessels. But the sympathetics, they are innervating even most parts of the blood vessels, except those capillaries, precapillaries, and the meta arterioles, which are not innervated. So you need to appreciate that. There are centers that are involved because you're talking of the autonomic nervous system. So you have centers within the medulla. So these centers, they are cardio accelerator center. So you have the cardio acceleratory center. And then you have cardio inhibitory center. So there are two centers, the cardio acceleratory center that is going to stimulate the heart rate via the sympathetics. Then you have the cardio inhibitory center that will inhibit the heart rate via the parasympathetics. Here you have the vagus nerve. Then we have the vasomotor center. The vasomotor center, these are the sympathetics that are innervating the blood vessels. So these are the major centers within the medulla. So this center is controlled by a nucleus, which is called nucleus tractor solitarius. So it's the one, once it's stimulated by certain pathways, it can result into stimulation of the cardio acceleratory center or inhibiting it, or it can stimulate the cardio inhibitory center or stimulating it, and also the vasomotor center, depending on the mechanisms that we are about to discuss in the next slide. So you have vasoconstriction that is produced by the sympathetic stimulation as a result of the neurotransmitter or the neurohormone that is produced, the noradrenaline or the norepinephrine. Then you have vasodilation that is caused by the release of acetylcholine. So all of this we are going to discuss. And also depending on the frequency of certain reflexes, like baroreceptor reflexes and also chemoreceptor reflexes. So the reflexes that are involved in blood pressure regulation, so this is still neural. Why? It's because the receptors you are, are talking of uh, nerves or innervation. So the neurons are the ones that are able to transmit these messages in form of action potentials. So we have the baroreceptors, which are the most important when you're talking of regulation of blood pressure. Then you also have chemoreceptor reflex. Then we have the atrial reflex pulmonary artery reflex. So these are reflexes that are involved in blood pressure regulation. The most important is the baroreceptor reflex. Then we also have chemoreceptor reflex. Then to some extent, we also have the atrial reflex and the pulmonary artery reflex. So the atrial reflex and the pulmonary artery reflex, these are called low pressure receptors. The other two, the first one, the baroreceptor is high, pressure reflex, then the chemoreceptor is responding to chemicals. So it has got nothing to do with pressure. Okay, so starting with the low pressure receptors, the atrial reflexes that activates the kidneys. This is also referred to as volume reflex. So the atrial reflexes that activates the kidneys, for instance, if you have an increase in blood volume, that will result into an increase in blood pressure. So if there's an increase in blood volume, you know to say that, there'll be an increase in venous return, there'll be an increase in end diastolic volume, there'll be an increase in stroke volume, there'll be an increase in cardiac output. And if you have an increase in cardiac output, you're going to have an increase in systolic blood pressure. So the blood pressure is going to increase as a result of an increase in blood volume. So what will be the, the mechanism in which is going to maintain this blood pressure so that it reduces back to the normal blood pressure? So the first one is the atrial reflexes that activates the kidneys. So this one here, like I said, you have an increase in blood volume that will result into an increase in blood pressure. 
that causes significant reflex dilation of the afferent arterioles. The afferent arterioles are the ones that are transporting blood to the kidneys. So if you have dilation of the afferent arterioles, the blood flow to the kidneys is going to increase, then the glomerular filtration rate is going to increase, the production of urine is going to increase. So you see that the blood volume will start decreasing. And once the blood volume is decreasing because you're losing most of these fluids in the urine, then the blood pressure is going to decrease. At the same time, <clears throat> there are signals that are transmitted simultaneously from the atria to the hypothalamus to decrease the secretion of antidiuretic hormone, ADH. You know to say the antidiuretic hormone is responsible for facilitating the formation of aquaporins too within the kidney nephron so that you have reabsorption of water. So if the production of this hormone, the antidiuretic hormone is reduced, it means that the reabsorption of water is also reduced. To some extent, you are increasing fluid loss. It means you are producing more urine. So if you are producing more urine, it means the blood volume will start reducing. And if you have a decrease in blood volume, then the blood pressure is going to decrease. So these are atrial reflexes that are going to activate the kidneys. It's called the volume reflex. Then you also have, <clears throat> So this is the, the atrial or pulmonary artery reflex. It's the same thing that I was explaining. If you have an increase in blood volume, it's going to have an effect on the atria. So the, there will be an increase in the atrial stretching. So those low pressure barrel receptors are going to be stimulated. So because they are responding to stretching or pressure, then it will cause a decrease in the renal sympathetic activity. So if you have a decrease in the renal sympathetic activity, you have more of vasodilation instead of vasoconstriction. So the vasodilation will result into an increase in blood flow to the kidneys, and then an increase in glomerular filtration rate. Then you're producing more urine. You are losing water. Blood volume will reduce, blood pressure will decrease. At the same time, <clears throat> you're going to have an increase in the atrial Naturetic peptide, and this is going to facilitate secretion of sodium and water excretion. It means that you're losing sodium, you're also losing water because of this hormone that will go to the kidneys and facilitate the excretion of sodium and also excretion of water because where sodium goes, water will follow. So, this is called the atrial and pulmonary artery reflexes. Then you also have the atrial reflex control of the heart rate. So now this is not the volume reflex of the atrial, but they are atrial reflex that control the heart rate. It's also called the bend bridge reflex or the bend bridge reflex. So this bend bridge reflex as a result into an increase in vagal tone, if you have an increase in vagal tone, it means that you're going to have venal constriction. Why? You're going to have more of, <clears throat> I mean, when you have an increase in vagal tone, you know to say that you, you're going to have more of dilatation, so the peripheral resistance is going to decrease to some extent. Then the venous retain is also going to increase. When the venous retain is increasing, it means you're going to have an increase in the atrial pressure because now the venous retain has increased. The atrial pressure is going to increase. The stretching also on the SA node. So the SA node will be stimulated. The heart rate is going to increase. The cardiac output is also going to increase. The, heart rate, um, the blood pressure is going to increase as a result of this atrial reflex that controls the heart rate. The SA node is going to be stimulated. So this is called the Bain bridge reflex. Maybe you don't understand there. This will help. <clears throat> 
So this is the same, the vein bridge. Atrial reflex is due to atrial stretch reflex or volume reflex. So if you have an increase in vagal tone, you're going to have an increase in right-sided feeling pressure. Then the stretching of the atria. So the atria, they're going to be stressed. Then they will send a signal that are going to stimulate the stretch receptors present within the atrial, the right atrial wall and carval atrial junction. The carval atrial junction, this is where you find the SA node. So it's going to stimulate the SA node and the firing of action potentials from the SA node, they are going to increase. That will cause an increase in the heart rate. At the same time, these receptors, once they are stimulated, <clears throat> The vagal myrinated afferent fibers are going to be stimulated. Then the cardiovascular center in the medulla will be stimulated. The efferents of the vagus nerve will be stimulated. Then you're going to have inhibition of the parasympathetics. So once the parasympathetics are inhibited, it means they have less effect on the heart. Remember the parasympathetics, they are inhibiting the heart rate. So once they are inhibited, then the heart rate is going to increase. This is called the Bain Bridge atrial reflex. So once the atria is stressed, the heart rate will increase to some extent. <clears throat> then let's go to the most important ones, the baro receptor reflex and the chemo receptor reflex, starting with the baro receptor reflex. So the barrel is, is receptor reflex, like I said, is, is the major <clears throat> reflex that is involved in control of blood pressure. So it's the neural control of blood pressure. So we have the barrel receptor, meaning that these receptors are responding to pressure. So once the pressure are increasing, even their receptor potential is going to increase, that will result into an increase in the firing of these receptor, barrel receptors. So they play a major role in control of blood pressure. The barrel receptors are spray type nerve endings that lie in the wall of arteries. So most arteries, they have these barrel receptors, but the barrel receptors are mainly abundant in certain locations. So in the carotid sinus, in the arctic arc, this is where you have most of the barrel receptors. So within the aortic arc, the action potentials will be transported via or transmitted via the vagus nerve or cranial nerve number 10. Then that of the carotid sinus, they'll be transmitted via the grossopharyngeal nerve or the cranial nerve number nine. So they are responding to pressure changes. So you find that these barrel receptors will not be stimulated in low pressure. So if there is low blood pressure, for instance, between zero and schiste, the barrel receptors won't be stimulated. So they are only stimulated when the pressure is higher. So you find that they will start increasing their response if the blood pressure is increasing to about 180 millimeter of mercury. So this is the location of the barrel receptors. So you have those that are found within the carotid sinus. So these are carotid sinus receptors. Then you have those that are found within the aortic arc receptors. So you can see the barrel receptors. So in the aortic arc, the action potentials, once they are generated here, they'll be transmitted via the vagus nerve or cranial nerve number 10. Then those from the carotid sinus, it's via the cranial nerve number nine, the grossopharyngeal nerve. These action potentials will be transmitted to the, the medulla or the brain. So within the medulla or the brain, this is where you find the nucleus of tractus solitarius and those uh, cardiac centers, the cardio acceleratory center and the cardio inhibitory center and the vesomotor center, like the ones that I've already explained to you guys. So how do they generate the action potentials, the barrel receptors? So once there's an increase in pressure, it will result into opening of mechanosensitive channels. 
So you have these mechanosensitive channels, the DEG and the INAC that are responding to pressure. So once there is an increase in pressure, they're going to open, that are going to allow influx of sodium and calcium. When sodium and calcium is entering the cells, it's depolarizing the cells, that will bring the membrane potential to threshold. Then there'll be opening of voltage dependent channels, like voltage dependent sodium channels, influx of sodium to produce an action potential. This action potential will be propagated to the medulla of the brain to stimulate those centers. Then you know to say, once the firing of these baroreceptors are increasing, then it will tell that nucleus tractor solitarius to say that the blood pressure has increased. So the nucleus of tractor solitarius will now inhibit the cardio acceleratory center, then it's going to stimulate the cardio inhibitory center. And you know to say the cardio inhibitory center, these are the parasympathetics. So via the vagus nerve, is going to inhibit the activities of the SA node and the AV node. So it's going to have the negative chronotropic effect and anotropic effect on the heart, and also the negative dromotropic effect on the heart. So it means that the heart rate is going to reduce, the conduction of action potential is going to reduce, and the force of contraction is going to reduce, the, the stroke volume is going to reduce, cardiac output is going to reduce, and then the blood pressure will start reducing. And then it goes back to the normal range. That's why when you have an increase in the firing of these baroreceptors, the brain will stop the activities of the SA node, or it will reduce the activities of the SA node and also the AV node. So you can see it here, that once you have an increase in blood pressure, it will result into arterial wall deformation. Then this arterial wall deformation, it will result into stimulation of the baroreceptors, which are mechanosensitive receptors. So these mechanoreceptors are going to be stimulated. Then they will generate action potentials that will be propagated via the vagus nerve and the grossopharyngeal nerve, depending on where they are coming from. From the aortic arc is via the vagus nerve. From the carotid sinus is via the grossopharyngeal nerve or cranial nerve number nine. So the firing of these baroreceptors is going to increase. So once the firing of the baroreceptors is increasing, you have this sensory information in form of action potentials that will be propagated to the nucleus tractor solitarius. And then the nucleus tractor solitarius will interpret that information to say, you have an increase in blood pressure. You need to slow down. So it's going to inhibit the cardio acceleratory center. Then it's going to stimulate the cardio inhibitory center. So once the cardio inhibitory center has been stimulated, it's going to send motor information to the SA node and the AV node that will slow down the firing of the SA node, slowing down the heart rate. Then it will also slow down the uh, transmission of the action potentials and also the force of contraction is going to reduce. The cardiac output will reduce, then the blood pressure will start reducing, then it goes back to the normal. Okay, so to some extent, I've already explained this diagram. So you can see you have the carotid sinus, you have baroreceptors here. In the aortic arc, you also have baroreceptors. So if you have an increase in blood pressure, these receptors, they are going to be stimulated. They will start firing action potentials. So the rate of firing of this action potential is going to increase. So information will be transferred meted via the cranial nerve number 10, the vagus nerve from the aortic arc, baroreceptors, then via the cranial nerve number nine from the carotid sinus, baroreceptors. So these action potentials are transmitted to the medulla of the brain where you have the nucleus tractus solitarius. So from here, the nucleus tractus solitarius is going to inhibit the cardio Accelerator, acceleratory uh, neurons, which are the sympathetics. So they're going to be inhibited. So the sympathetics won't be releasing no epinephrine to stimulate the SA node and the AV node. But it's going to activate the cardio inhibitory center. These are the parasympathetics that are releasing acetylcholine. 
that will now have a negative ionotropic effect, negative dermotropic effect, and negative chronotropic effect on the heart. So the heart rate is going to reduce and the conduction of action potentials is going to reduce. Then the cardiac output will reduce, the blood pressure will start reducing and then it's normalized, goes back to the normal values. Okay, so certain conditions that will stimulate the baroreceptors. So let's start from this one here. So this is the baroreceptor uh, effects. So going from lying to standing position. So if a person is changing posture, maybe you are from lying down and then you want to stand up, you know you have gravitational force effects on the, on the venous retain. So what will happen to the blood pressure? When you change position from lying down to standing up, from supine position to standing up or from lying down to standing up. So you know to say, when you are changing from lying down to standing position, there is decrease in venous retain. Why? It's because of the gravitational force effect on the venous retain. We say that much of the blood will be accumulated within the dependent limbs. So the extremities, the legs and the hands, that's where blood will be accumulating. So that will result into reduction in venous retain. So when you have reduction or a decrease in venous retain, you know to say you're going to have a decrease in end diastolic volume. You're going to have a decrease in pre -rot. So if you have a decrease in end diastolic volume, that will result into a decrease in stroke volume, that will result into a decrease in cardiac output. This is simple and straightforward. If the cardiac output is decreasing, the blood pressure will also decrease because you are pumping less blood into the arterial system. So you have less fluids in the arterial system, you have less hydrostatic pressure, so it means you have less blood pressure as a result of a decrease in cardiac output. <clears throat> so if you, have, if you have a decrease in blood pressure, this will act as a stimulus or a stimuli to the barrel receptors. Remember, the barrel receptors will fire action potentials when they are stimulated. But in this case, when you have a decrease in blood pressure, it means that the firing of barrel receptors will reduce. So they will send the sensory information to the medulla oblongata. So within the medulla oblongata of the brain, you know to say that it's going to stimulate the sympathetics now. Why? It's because the nucleus of tractus solitarius here who know once the firing of the barrel receptor is reducing, the information that is sent here is that the blood pressure has reduced. So you need to do something to increase the blood pressure. So it's going to stimulate the cardio acceleratory centers, which are the sympathetics. Then it's going to inhibit the parasympathetics. So the cardio inhibitory center are going to be inhibited. If you have more of sympathetic stimulation, you know to say that there will be release of no epinephrine that will bring about vasoconstriction of arteries. If you have vasoconstriction of arteries, you are increasing total peripheral resistance. If you are increasing total peripheral resistance, then that will result into an increase in blood pressure. So you can see that the blood pressure will increase as a feedback mechanism. At the same time, if you have sympathetic stimulation, the SA node will be stimulated more, the AV node will be stimulated, so the rate of firing of action potential will increase, the conduction, the velocity of action potentials is also going to increase, that will result into an increase in the heart rate, that will translate into an increase in cardiac output, if you have an increase in cardiac output, you know to say that blood pressure is going to increase. So this is a barrel receptor reflex as a result of reduction in blood pressure. If you have hemorrhage, it's the same, you're also going to have decrease in blood pressure because if you are, have hemorrhage, you're losing blood. So the arterial pressure is going to decrease, then the firing of arterial barrel receptors is also going to decrease, so it's the same. So you know to say that the parasympathetics will be inhibited, the sympathetics will be stimulated, so the cardio inhibitory centers are inhibited, 
the cardiostimulatory centers are stimulated. So this will cause stimulation of the SA node, an increase in heart rate, that will result into an increase in cardiac output and an increase in arterial pressure. The sympathetics themselves, <clears throat> when you have an increase, they have an effect on the cardiac muscle, they will increase the stroke volume. So the contractility of the cardiac muscles are going to increase as a result of the sympathetic discharge. The no epinephrine is going to have a positive anotropic effect on the heart. The contractility is going to increase, the cardiac output is going to increase, then the arterial pressure is going to increase. The increase in sympathetic discharge again <clears throat> to the veins, you know to say it's going to cause uh, venal constriction. So if you have constriction of peripheral vein, then the compliance of the veins is reducing, the venous retain is going to increase, the venous pressure is going to increase, then the venous retain is going to increase, the end diastolic volume is going to increase, meaning that the pre is increasing, then the contractility is also going to increase when you have an increase in end diastolic volume. This is called the frank starring law, whereby we said if these muscles are stretched more, they are going to increase their contractility because you're exposing more actin to mouse. So the contractility is going to increase, the cardiac output to increase, the arterial blood pressure is also going to increase. Then the other pathway here, the sympathetic stimulation <clears throat> is going to cause an increase in constriction of the arterioles. So the resistance is going to increase. So the total peripheral resistance is going to increase then that will translate into an increase in blood pressure. So all this is barrel receptor reflex, which is very important. Then the next one, <clears throat> you have the chemoreceptor reflex. So I need to speed up. The chemoreceptor reflex is closely associated with the barrel receptor control system because where you find those barrel receptors, somewhere there you also have chemoreceptors that are responding to the chemicals. For instance, hypoxia or decrease in oxygen pressure, then also an increase in carbon dioxide, the decrease in pH. So they are responding to that. So these chemoreceptors are chemosensitive cells that are sensitive to oxygen lack or hypoxia, carbon dioxide excess, if you have an increase in carbon dioxide, and also hydrogen ion excess, a decrease in pH. That's why they are called chemoreceptors. So where do you find them? They are found within the carotid body and the arctic body. <clears throat> so you can see the carotid body here and the arctic body. This is where you find the chemoreceptors. They are not responding to pressure, but they are responding to chemicals. In this case, oxygen, carbon dioxide, hydrogen ions. The hydrogen ions, you're talking of the pH. So they are also transmitting action potentials via the vagus nerve, which is the cranial nerve number 10, from the aortic bodies. Then from the carot carotid body, it's via the grossopharyngeal nerve. So it's similar to baroreceptors in terms of the pathways. <clears throat> so how do they operate? So when you're talking about the baroreceptors, for instance, if you have a decrease in blood pressure. It means you are decreasing the amount of blood that is moving to the arteries. So the concentration of oxygen is going to decrease. So that hypoxia will stimulate these chemoreceptors to fire action potentials. So these action potentials will be transmitted to the medulla oblongata within the nucleus of tractus solitarius. It will sense to say you have less oxygen, you need to increase blood pressure. So it's going to stimulate the cardio acceleratory center, then it's going to inhibit the cardio inhibitory center. That will result into an increase in heart rate, then the cardiac output to increase blood pressure will increase. If you have more carbon dioxide, if you have more carbon dioxide, it simply means that this blood is also <clears throat> not moving so well. So if you have accumulation of carbon dioxide, it means the blood pressure is reducing. So you need to increase the blood pressure. If carbon dioxide is accumulating, it means the blood pressure is reducing. 
So they metabolize from the tissues are not being transported. That's why you have an increase. So it's going to stimulate these chemo receptors. They will fire action potentials to the medulla blangata. Then it will know to say that the blood pressure has reduced. So it will now stimulate the cardio acceleratory center. Then it's going to inhibit the cardio inhibitory center. So the heart rate is going to increase. Then the cardiac output will increase. Then the blood pressure will increase. Okay. <clears throat> So this diagram is just summarizing the baroreceptor and the chemoreceptor, just in the same diagram. So you can see here you have the carotid sinus that contain the baroreceptor. Then you have the carotid body that contain the chemoreceptors. So they are related. Down here, you have the aortic receptors, and then you also have aortic baroreceptors. So via the cranial nerve number 10, vagus nerve, then from the aortic sinus in the aortic body is via cranial nerve number nine, the glossopharyngeal. But this information is taken to the medulla oblongata, where it's going to either inhibit or stimulate the cardiac acceleratory center or the cardiac inhibitory center, depending on the information that is brought in that I've already explained. So I don't need to explain this diagram. So we'll move on to autoregulation. So this is local regulation of blood pressure. But in, as much as I'm talking about local regulation of blood pressure, it has got more to do with the blood flow. So you know to say certain organs would want to maintain blood flow to their tissues despite changes in blood pressure. So sometimes you can have fluctuations of blood pressure, but certain organs would still want to maintain the blood flow to those organs, for instance, the kidneys. Despite having changes in blood pressure, you find that the kidneys will maintain the blood flow so that they are able to filter those toxins and waste products from the blood. Otherwise, if you have hypotension, then the blood flow to the kidneys is releasing. That will result into accumulation of toxins. And then it can bring about certain pathologies. So you find that there is autoregulation of of blood flow to the tissues. So because the blood flow, there's a relationship between blood pressure and blood flow. So it means factors that will have an effect on blood flow can also have an effect on blood pressure. So the capacity of tissues to regulate their own blood flow is referred to as autoregulation. Most vascular beds have an intrinsic capacity to compensate for moderate changes in perfusion pressure by changes in the vascular resistance so that blood flow remains relatively constant. So you need to maintain the blood flow despite changes in blood pressure. So you find that if these mechanisms, they'll have an effect on blood flow, somehow they'll also have an effect on blood pressure. So it is probably due to, in part, to the intrinsic contractile response of smooth muscle to stretch. So this is referred to as myogenic theory of autoregulation. In simple terms, when you stretch blood vessels, they are smooth muscles, and those smooth muscles, they also contain mechanosensitive receptors that are sensitive to stretching. So if you have an increase in blood pressure, you find that those smooth muscle cells will be stressed, then that will result in two opening of mechanosensitive channels for calcium, for instance, that will bring about influx of calcium, and this calcium will bring about smooth muscle contraction. For instance, that calcium can go and bind to camodulin, and calcium camodulin complex can go and activate mousing light chain kinase that will go and phosphorylate the mousing heads, then the mousing will be able to bind to actin, that will bring about the power stroke and then smooth muscle contraction. So you find that when smooth muscle cells are stressed, they are going to contract. So if blood pressure is increasing, the smooth muscle cells are going to contract to minimize blood flow to these organs. So you find that this is referred to as autoregulation. So the myogenic, you're looking at the function of the smooth muscle cells. Then you also have vasodilator substances that tend to accumulate in tissues. So for instance, if blood pressure is reducing, the blood flow to the organs is also going to reduce. 
if the blood flow to the organs is reducing, then there are certain metabolites that will start accumulating in those tissues. And those metabolites are vasodilators. So they will result into vasodilatation of blood vessels, increasing the blood flow to those tissues, despite changes in blood pressure. This diagram here is just summarizing the vasodilation and vasoconstriction. So there are factors that will bring about vasoconstriction and other factors that will bring about vasoconstriction, uh, vasodilation. So this side you have constriction and then the other side you have dilation. So you have local factors like decrease in local temperature, it will result into vasoconstriction. So if you have a decrease in local temperature, you can have vasoconstriction because you don't want to lose the heat to the outside environment. So this is called auto-duration. Then on the other side here, if you have an increase in carbon dioxide, a decrease in oxygen, an increase in potassium, genosine, lactate, then a decrease in local pH, an increase in local temperature, these will cause dilation of blood vessels increasing the blood flow. Then you also have endothelial products. So on the endothelial cells, you have endothelial products. Some of them, they are uh, vasoconstricting factors. For instance, you have endothelin one. We discussed this in blood physiology to bring about vasoconstriction. Then you also have serotonin that is being produced by platelets from boxing A2, all these factors will cause vasoconstriction. On the other hand, you have factors that can cause vasodilation. You have nitric oxide. So you have endothelial derived nitric oxide that will bring about smooth muscle relaxation. Then you have vasodilation. Then you have kinase. Then you have prostacycline that can cause dilation. I think this we discussed. Then you have secreting hormones. Many of these hormones um, are produced by certain organs, and then some of them they're coming from the the GIT, the gastrointestinal tract system. So you have, for instance, epinephrine. Okay, that will cause vasoconstriction, except in skeletal muscles and the liver, that will bring about vaso vasodilation. So you need to understand this as well. You now, epinephrine, you know, it's a vasoconstrictor. Then you have atrial, or you have arginine vasopressin, which is called ADH, then you have angiotensin 2, then you have these inhibitors for sodium, potassium, ATPs inhibitors, the neuropeptide Y. On the other hand, you have epinephrine, then you also have other hormones like calcitonin generated peptide. So this is called calcitonin generated peptide. It's a dilator, substance P, histamine. And then you also have atrio natriuretic peptide. Then you have vasoactive intestinal peptide. So these are the factors that can result into vasoconstriction or vasodilation, depending on their effect on these cells. So you can take time to to read on uh, these factors and how they can result into constriction or dilation of blood vessels, regulating blood pressure. Then the long-term regulation, these are called hormonal. So the hormones that are involved in regulating blood pressure, it takes a bit of time. So that's why they are referred to as long-term. So the most important one here is the renin angiotensin aldestron system. Then you also have the effect of epinephrine and no epinephrine on blood vessels, of course, you know, those receptors that bring about vasoconstriction. Then you also have the effect of antidiuretic hormone, ADH, which is also called vasopressin hormone. Then you also have atrionatriuretic peptide. So these are hormones that will have an effect on blood pressure. So starting with the most interesting one, renin angiotensin aldestron system. So I'll explain from the diagrams. These are just notes for you to study. So let's start. So renin angiotensin aldestron system. 
So the, uh, the kidneys are the ones that produce a hormone which is called renin. But for them to release and produce this hormone renin, you need to have a decrease in the renal perfusion. So if you have a decrease in blood pressure, that will translate into a decrease in the renal perfusion. Then the juxtaglomerular apparatus, there are cells there which are called granular cells. And these granular cells, when there is a decrease in the renal perfusion, they will sense an increase in the sodium because the flow of the flow of fluids within the kidney nephron will reduce. And some of these cells will be reabsorbing much of the sodium. And you have sodium sensitive channels that can stimulate the granular cells to release renin. So renin will be released due to low blood pressure. This renin is able to convert a precursor of a hormone. This precursor is produced by the liver cells. So the liver cells are producing a precursor, which is called uh, a hormone precursor, which is called angiotensinogen. So renin will convert angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. The angiotensin 1 in circulation, it will be transported by the cardiovascular system to the lungs and also to the kidneys. So within the lungs and the kidneys, there is an enzyme which is called angiotensin converting enzyme. The angiotensin converting enzyme is going to convert the angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. The angiotensin 2 has got a lot of vessel uh, cardiovascular function. So it will have an effect on the cardiovascular system. So how is this angiotensin 2 going to increase the blood pressure? So now listen. So the first effect, the angiotensin 2 can stimulate the sympathetic activity, meaning that the angiotensin 2 can stimulate the release of no epinephrine. So when you have an increase in no epinephrine, that will result into vessel constriction. Then the veins compliance will reduce as they are constricting. The venous return is going to increase. Then the cardiac output will increase. The blood pressure is going to increase. At the same time, it's going to cause vessel constriction of the smaller arteries. So if you have vessel constriction of the smaller arteries, total peripheral resistance is going to increase. If total peripheral resistance is increasing, we said blood pressure is also going to increase. The same angiotensin 2 can go to the kidneys to facilitate reabsorption of sodium and chloride. So there is reabsorption of sodium and chloride in exchange for potassium. Then if you are reabsorbing sodium and chloride, you are creating a concentration that will now attract water molecules. So if you are reabsorbing sodium and chloride, you're also reabsorbing water. The blood volume will increase, venous return will increase, cardiac output will increase, then the blood pressure will increase. The angiotensin II can go to the adrenal glands. So within the cortex of the adrenal glands, there are cells that can produce aldestrone hormone. So the angiotensin II can stimulate those cells that produce aldestrone in the adrenal cortex. So the adrenal gland cortex will be stimulated. Then they will release or they will secrete aldestrone. Aldestrone is the hormone that will be transported to the kidney nephron. Within the kidney nephron, it will facilitate the reabsorption of sodium and chloride by facilitating the formation of those channels that are responsible for reabsorption of sodium and chloride. And then if you are reabsorbing much of sodium and chloride, water will follow. An increase in blood volume, venous return, cardiac output, blood pressure will increase. Angiotensin II will also have an effect on blood vessels. 
it's a vasoconstrictor. So it's atriolar vasoconstriction and increase in blood pressure. So you know to say if you have atriolar vasoconstriction, the total peripheral pressure is increasing, blood pressure is going to increase. Then there's got an effect on the pituitary gland. The posterior lobe of the pituitary gland is the one that is responsible for release of the neural hormones, not the production. They are being produced by certain nuclei within the hypothalamus, the preoptic nuclei and the paraventricular nucleus. They are the ones that are producing the neural hormones, the two neural hormones, which is oxytocin and ADH, antidiuretic hormone. So the angiotensin II will go and stimulate the release of ADH, antidiuretic hormone, that will go to the kidney nephron and facilitate the formation of aquaporins too. And the aquaporins too are responsible for reabsorption of water molecules. So water will be reabsorbed into the body. The blood volume will increase. Uh, venous return will increase. Cardiac output will increase. Blood pressure is going to increase. So these are the effect of angiotensin too. So you know to say it has got more effects in terms of regulating blood pressure. So you need to understand this renin angiotensin aldestron system, which could be a very good question in terms of essence. So these are the effect of renin angiotensin aldestron system with regards to the function of angiotensin. So it's a vasoconstrictor, I've already explained, stimulate the test center in the brain. So the same angiotensin II can go to the thirsty centers in the brain and stimulate them so that you have the desire to drink more water or fluids. So as you are drinking more fluids in the GIT, there is absorption of the fluids that will result into an increase in plasma volume or blood volume. Then venous return will increase, cardiac output will increase because the stroke volume is going to increase because of frank steering mechanism then the stroke volume is increasing, cardiac output is increasing, then the blood pressure is going to increase when you drink a lot of water. Then it's going to stimulate additional release of norepinephrine from the sympathetic nerve endings, like I've already explained. It's also going to stimulate the adrenal cortex of the adrenal gland to produce aldestrone. And I've told you the function of aldestrone on the on the kidney nephron. So you can see the adrenal gland here. You have this zona glomerulosa that is responsible for the production of aldestrone. These are mineral corticoids. So aldestrone production will increase because of angiotensin II. And this aldestrone, what is the function? The aldestrone will be transported by the blood or the cardiovascular system. It will go to the kidney nephron. The epithelium cells of the kidney nephron it will enter because it's a steroid hormone. So it's able to pass through the phospholipid to enter the cells. It will go and bind to the receptors within the cells, the cytoplasmic receptors that will migrate to the nucleus to, to facilitate transcription into messenger RNA. And then this messenger RNA will facilitate the production or the synthesis of proteins that will become channels for sodium and potassium. So there'll be more channels that will appear here. Then you also have production of enzymes and also channels. For instance, sodium potassium ATPase pumps, they'll be incorporated within the basolateral side of the membrane. On the apical side, you have potassium and sodium channels. So you have influx of sodium that is exchanged for potassium. This potassium is excreted. You are gaining sodium. So if you are gaining sodium via paracellular movement, chloride will follow. So where the sodium and chloride, water will also follow. So overall, you have reabsorption of water because of these electrolytes that you are gaining here. Okay, <clears throat> then we said it's also going to stimulate the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland to secrete ADH and diuretic hormone of vasopressin. So you can see these nuclei 
So you have two nuclei that are producing those hormones. So you have paraventricular nucleus and supraoptic nucleus. These are producing oxytocin and ADH. So the ADH will be produced here. It will be transported by axonal transportation. Then it will be stored within the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland. So once you have angiotensin II, it will stimulate the release of ADH. And ADH has got two effects. It can go and cause vasoconstriction of blood vessels via the V1 receptor, or it can cause the, the production and also translocation of aquaporins too. So you can see here that the, due to this angiotensin II, there's an increase in production of vasopressin, which is called ADH. So via V1 receptor, it will result into vasoconstriction increasing arterial pressure because of increasing total peripheral resistance and also increasing venous detent. Then you can see via the, the V2 receptors in the kidney nephron, it will increase the reabsorption of water because you have more translocation of aquaporins too. So you can see the ADH here, when it's released from the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland, it will be transported via blood so it will move to the kidney nephron, it will go and bind to the receptors. Because this is water-soluble hormone, it doesn't enter the cells. So it will just go and bind to the receptors. These are G-protein coupled receptors. That will result into activation of the G-protein. And this G-protein will activate the adenylate cyclase enzyme that will convert ATP into cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP will activate the protein kinase A. And this protein kinase A is involved in the translocation of the aquaporins too. That will be translocated into the apical side of the kidney nephron. This is the lumen of the kidney nephron. So once you have these appearances of aquaporins too, this cell becomes more permeable to water. Water will start leaving the lumen, entering the cells. Then it will be transported via aquaporins three on the basolateral side of the membrane then it will enter the interstitial, then it will go back to the circulation. An increase in, in water, it means that blood volume will increase because plasma volume will increase, venous return will increase, stroke volume will increase, cardiac output will increase, and blood pressure will increase. Then it causes cardiac and vascular hypertrophy. So if there's uh, cardiac hypertrophy, there's development of the myocardium that will result into an increase in the contractility. Then if the contractility is increasing, the stroke volume will also increase. So that will also cause an increase in cardiac output. Then it can also stimulate the kidneys to release epinephrine and no epinephrine. And you know the effect of epinephrine and also no epinephrine on the cardiovascular. You know you have vasoconstriction, Total peripheral resistance will increase, blood pressure will increase. Then on the other side, epinephrine will also have an effect on the SA node and AV node, increasing the heart rate. Stroke volume will increase. Then on the venous side, there's venal constriction, the venous return will also increase. That will result into an increase in cardiac output and also blood pressure. So you know these things by now. So I've already explained the effect of epinephrine and no epinephrine due to the sympathetic stimulation and also the sympathetic stimulation can stimulate the adrenal medulla to release catecholamines. So these catecholamines now will have an effect on the cardiovascular system to cause an increase in the heart rate and also the force of contraction is going to increase. <clears throat> then antidiuretic hormone is also produced by the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland. So I've already explained the effect of ADH on the cardiovascular system via V1 receptors is going to cause vasoconstriction, increasing the total peripheral resistance, increasing the blood pressure. At the same time, vasovenal constriction, increasing the venous return, and also cardiac output. Blood pressure is also going to increase. Then on the kidney nephron, we say that this is a hormone that will go and bind to the G-protein coupled receptors. Once it binds to the G-protein coupled receptors, 
there is activation of the J protein. The alpha protein subunit will dissociate from the beta gamma protein subunit. The alpha protein subunit will go and activate the adenylocyclase enzyme that will convert aden uh, adenosine triphosphate into cyclic AMP, ATP into cyclic AMP. The cyclic AMP will activate the protein kinase A. The protein kinase A is going to facilitate translocation of aquaporins too. On the apical side of the epithelium cells in the kidney nephron. So you have appearances of aquaporins too that will render this cell permeability to water. So there is reabsorption of water via aquaporins too on the apical side of the cells. But on the basolateral side of the cells, you have aquaporins three that will facilitate movement of water molecules from these epithelium cells into the interstitial, from the interstitial to the cardiovascular system, an increase in plasma volume, which will translate into an increase in blood volume. Then the venous return will increase, cardiac output will increase, blood pressure will increase. So you know all that information by now. Then the atrionaturetic peptide, I've also explained its effect on the kidneys, that will also result into an a decrease in reabsorption of water, and then you have more production of urine. So the blood volume is going to reduce, blood pressure is reduced, because this hormone is produced when you have high blood pressure. If you had high blood pressure, the atrial, the atria wall is going to be stressed, and then those low pressure receptors are going to be stimulated. Then they are also going to produce this hormone that will have an effect causing vasodilation and the of vasodilation of the afferent arterioles, these afferent arterioles that are supplying the, the kidney nephrons, and then you know to say that the glomerular filtration is going to increase. Then you're going to be losing a lot of water in the urine. So blood pressure will reduce because the blood volume is going to reduce. Okay, so you can see here the atrial stretching producing these hormones, the atrionaturetic peptide or factor. So the atrionaturetic peptide or the atrionaturetic factor is going to be secreted or released. So it will have vasodilation that will also decrease the total peripheral resistance. If the total peripheral resistance is decreasing, the blood pressure is also decreasing. On the other side, it will also cause vasodilation of the, the afferent arterioles that are supplying the kidneys. So the glomerular filtration is going to increase, and then production of urine is going to increase. You're losing water via the urine, blood volume is also going to decrease, blood pressure will decrease. Bit of information on hypertension and hypotension. So this is pathology, so we don't waste much time here in physiology. You just need to appreciate a bit. So you need to know to say hypotension is an, a decrease in blood pressure. Then hypertension is an increase in blood pressure. So remember that blood pressure regulatory mechanism will ensure that the blood pressure is maintained within the normal ranges. But sometimes these mechanisms, they can fail. So failure of these mechanisms due to various reasons will result into an increase or a decrease in blood pressure, which is obvious case. So some causes of abnormal blood pressure are well studied and understood, but others are not known. So those which are not known are referred to as idiopathic or idiopathic or unknown. So some of the causes of these blood pressure, an increase in blood pressure or a decrease in blood pressure, they are known or unknown. Others are None. This diagram here is summarizing the blood pressure. So the one shown in green, this is the ideal blood pressure that is maintained within the body. So you can see on the y-axis you have systolic, then on the y-axis you have diastolic blood pressure. So the diastolic blood pressure, the normal diastolic blood pressure needs to be maintained between at least 60 and 80, this is acceptable range of diastolic blood pressure, 60 to 80. Diastolic blood pressure, 60 to 80. Then the systolic blood pressure should be maintained between 100 and 120. So if 
the systolic blood pressure is less than 90, then it's low hypotension. Then the diastolic blood pressure is less than 60, it's low. So this is hypotension, low blood pressure. This is an ideal or the normal blood pressure. Then if the systolic blood pressure is greater than 120, or if it's between 120 and 140, then the diastolic blood pressure is between 80 and 90. This is called the pre-high blood pressure. So these patients with pre-high blood pressure, they need to be monitored. Otherwise, they'll, their, their condition can progress into the high blood pressure range. So here you need to do a lot of intervention because the normal regulatory mechanisms in here, they are failed due to some pathologies. So intervention is needed before these guys become hypertensive. So this is called pre-high blood pressure. If the blood pressure increases from 140 to above 190, this is the systolic blood pressure and the diastolic blood pressure greater than 90 or between 90 and 100. These are called hypertensive. So the hypertensive, they also need intervention. So they can change from hypertensive into pre-high blood pressure. Then sometimes they can even go back to ideal blood pressure because of intervention. But in most cases, they just need to be monitored and managed. Because with age, people start having pre-high blood pressure and then they can progress to high blood pressure if they are not monitored. Okay, so hypertension is it's common worldwide. So it can affect about 1 billion people worldwide. So hypertension. So let's start by discussing hypertension, just a bit of information here. So hypertension is a physiological state in which arterial blood pressure is abnormally low. So low blood pressure, low than 120 over 80. So anything low than that is referred to as hypotension, low blood pressure. So for adults, the hypotension exists when the systolic blood pressure is less than 90 millimeter of mercury and the diastolic blood pressure is less than 60, which is simple and straightforward. So you know to say if you have hypotension, then the arterial, the, the mean arterial blood pressure is going to reduce and then the perfusion to the tissues is also going to reduce then the delivery of oxygen and, and other nutrients will also decrease. That will result into cellular damage and dysfunction as a result of hypoxia. Maybe you have necrosis that will start developing within the tissues. So when the oxygen delivery is insufficient to support tissue metabolic requirements, the person is said to be in circulatory shock. So if the mean arterial blood pressure is so low, as a result of low blood pressure, that will result into low perfusion to the tissues. Then this person is said to be in circulatory shock. So in lecture seven, I will explain the circulatory shock. So here I won't waste much time discussing it. Okay, so we move on. So hypertension may result from different things it can be due to reduced cardiac output so blood pressure will reduce and then you become hypotensive and then hypovolemia meaning that you have low blood volume blood pressure can be low blood volume redistribution for instance in case of the effect of gravity when you stand up there's a distribution of blood pressure uh, of blood to the extremities that can also result into low blood pressure. They reduce systemic vascular resistance when you have vasodilation, you have reduced total peripheral resistance. It means that your diastolic blood pressure will reduce. Remember, the cardiac output, it, have, it has more effect on systolic blood pressure than the total peripheral resistance that's got more effect on the, uh, the diastolic blood pressure. Then if you have vascular obstruction, example in pulmonary embolism, that can also result into low blood pressure because you have an obstruction 
of blood flow to the lungs, and then later on, the blood flow from the lungs to the heart will reduce, and that will also result into hypotension. So these are <clears throat> conditions that can result into hypotension. So it can be due to factors that are affecting the heart itself or factors that are affecting the cardiovascular or the, the blood vessels or vascular blood vessels. So factors that are affecting the heart, mainly they are affecting the cardiac output, hence affecting the diastolic blood pressure. Factors that are affecting the blood vessels, mainly you are talking of total peripheral resistance. So it will have more effect on systolic blood pressure. So those that are affecting the, the heart, for instance, you have cardiac arrhythmias in blood cardia, you know, to say that heart rate is reducing, then the cardiac output will reduce, there will be low blood pressure. In certain tachycardia, whereby the heart rate has increased so much to the extent that the filling time is reduced, it means that the diastolic time is reduced in tachycardia. Remember, under normal circumstances, the cardiac cycle is spending much time in, in diastole, so one third in systole, two thirds in diastole. When you have an increase in heart rate so much that you have a decrease in diastole time, that will result into decrease in filling time. The end diastolic volume will decrease, the stroke volume will decrease, the cardiac output will decrease in the heart rate. I mean, the, the blood pressure also decreases. That's why here tachycardia is coming when you're looking at a decrease in low cardiac output. Fibrillation also, it will result into the same. No feeding time because of an increase in the contractility of the myocardium. So this is an, an effect on cardiac arrhythmias. And then you have an effect on cardiac structural disease. So these are structural disease of the heart, for instance, the valve disease when you have stenosis or the valves, then the cardiac, the stroke volume will reduce, cardiac output will reduce. Ischemic heart disease affecting the myocardium, the contractility will reduce, cardiac output will reduce and the stroke volume will reduce, blood pressure will reduce. Pericardial disease that are affecting the pericardium also have an effect on the heart. The cardiac tamponade, the cardiac tamponade is infusion of fluid in the pericardial cavity that will start compressing the heart, then the heart won't be relaxing very well, then the feeling of the ventricles will reduce, the end diastolic volume will reduce, the stroke volume will reduce, cardiac output will reduce, and you expect the blood pressure will also reduce. So I have congenital disease that can just affect the heart. You're just born with these diseases. Then you have obstructive disease or obstructive cardiomyopathy that will result into the blood pressure, decrease in blood pressure. Dilated cardiomyopathy, you find that they are so weak to pump blood out of the ventricles because of this dilated cardiomyopathy. So there is atrophy of the myocardium in most cases. Then the primary pulmonary hypertension. So if you have primary pulmonary hypertension, it means that the force in which the right ventricle has to pump blood into the pulmonary trunk has increased. So the stroke volume of the right ventricle is going to decrease then the venous return is also going to decrease from the pulmonary vein. Then even the right side, the venous, the, the end diastolic volume is also going to decrease. The blood pressure will decrease, you know that. Hypovolemia, a decrease in blood volume will also result into a decrease in blood pressure due to hemorrhage, diarrhea, maybe losing fluids via diarrhea, dehydration, orthostatic, Orthostatic volume shift is due to gravity, like I explained. When you're changing position from lying down to standing up, there's a shift of fluids to the extremities that can result into hypertension, certain drugs like diuretics, 
that will result into losing of fluids via the urine. So your urine production is increasing, so blood volume also decreases. Those factors that will have an effect on blood vessels, mainly you have systemic vasodilation. In terms of sepsis, sepsis, this is extreme allergic reaction due to infection. Anaphylaxis is also <clears throat> due to infection. So find that these they have an effect on, on the blood pressure. So you have anaphylaxis, which is an, a severe allergic reaction. Sepsis is also a, a consequence of, of an infection. Then you can also have neurogenic due to maybe misfiring of the sympathetics, and then they are not stimulating their heart to increase the heart rate, so the cardiac output will reduce, then the blood pressure will be low. Autonomic dysfunction also, there are certain drugs. <clears throat> so again, here you have the pulmonary embolism, which is obstructive. So the total peripheral resistance is decreasing, and then that will also result into hypotension. So factors affecting the heart and the blood vessels that will result into hypertension. Then a bit of information on hypertension, high blood pressure. So hypertension is a condition that affects, or it's a condition that basically affects a lot of people. So you can see about 1 billion people worldwide are affected by this condition, or they are hypertensive. And you know to say this hypertensive is a leading cause of morbidity and mortality. So it claims a lot of lives. Those hypertensive people, they die out of it. So it's a leading cause of morbidity and mortality. So more than 20% of Americans are hypertensive. And one third of these Americans, they are not even aware that they are hypertensive. So because one third of people who are hypertensive, they are not even aware that they are hypertensive. So this hypertension is also referred to as a disease that is called a silent killer. So it's a silent killer because certain people, they don't know that they are hypertensive because they don't take measurements of their BP, so they wouldn't know whether they are hypertensive or maybe they are pre-hypertensive state. So by the time they are realizing to say they have the disease is when the damage has already taken place. And this damage will result into certain uh, conditions like stroke, myocardial infarction, renal dysfunction, visual problems that are observed. So by the time they're realizing they're already gone. So that's why it's also a leading cause of mortality because some people, they are sick, but they don't know that they are sick. So it's a silent killer. Okay. So when do you diagnose one with hypertension or high blood pressure? It's when the arterial pressure is greater than or equal to 120 over 80. So if the, the blood pressure is greater than 120 over 80, these people are said to have elevated pressure or hypertensive. So even the mean arterial pressure is also going to increase, but in most cases, mean arterial pressure is not measured in patients. Okay, but you understand that <clears throat> in the past years, the diastolic value was emphasized in assessing hypertension. So you know to say hypertension mainly is due to an increase in total peripheral resistance, especially with regard to the function of the blood vessels. If there are factors that are causing hardening of blood vessels, which is called atherosclerosis, or maybe there is abnormal deposition of fat, fat materials in the inner lining of blood vessels that will result into atherosclerosis. So all those who predispose such people to hypertension because if you have hardening, it means the compliance of these elastic arteries is reducing. So you find that the blood pressure is also going to increase. And then on top of that, 
the total peripheral resistance, if it's increasing, the blood pressure is also going to increase. So we say that the total peripheral resistance is the main factor that is looking at the diastolic blood volume or diastolic blood pressure. So that's why emphasis was mainly, it was mainly regarded that the diastolic blood pressure was the one that was going to determine the hypertension. But in recent years, it was recognized that both the systolic and diastolic were very important because in cases where you have a systolic hypertension, it was associated with incidence of coronary and also cardiovascular diseases. So in, nowadays, both systolic and diastolic is considered when you're looking at hypertensive or they are considered as the risk factors or important risk factors. So there are two classes of hypertension. So these two classes, we have the primary or which is called insertial hy hypertension. So the primary or insertial hypertension is also referred to as idiopathic hypertension, which is common, affecting about 90 to 95% of the patients. So 90 to 95% of hypertensive cases are primary or essential hypertensive or hypertension. So the cause is unknown. That's why it's also referred to as idiopathic. Then we have secondary hypertension. In secondary hypertension, it's only affecting five to 10 percent of hypertensive patients. So it's, it's not common, but it's mainly secondary to certain diseases. So that's why it's called secondary hypertension. It can be secondary to renal diseases, for instance, if there is no filtration taking place there, blood volume will start increasing, then you have hypertension. It can be secondary to endo endocrine disorders due to those hormones that are involved in the duration of blood pressure or other identifiable causes. So here the causes are known. That's why it's called secondary, it's secondary to something. So you can see here hypertension, you have cardiac output, systemic vascular resistance. So the cardiac output, what is affecting the cardiac output, if you have an increase in cardiac output, you're going to have an increase in blood pressure, then you can have hypertension. So an increase in, for instance, blood volume in hypervolemia. So in hypervolemia, it can be due to renal artery stenosis, whereby you are not filtering a lot of fluids. So there's accumulation of fluids in the cardiovascular system. You can have renal diseases. Then you can also have hyperaldosteronism, an increase in production of aldosterone. And you know to say aldosterone will result into more reabsorption of sodium and chloride. Then you have more reabsorption of water. So production of urine is reduced. Then you start producing concentrated urine. And then you have an increase in blood volume that will result into an increase in blood pressure. Then you can also have hypersecretion of ADH, those aquaporins too, that result in reabsorption of water and then an increase in blood volume. You know what happens? Blood pressure will increase. Then you can have aortic co actations. So you have aortic core actations. This is just like narrowing of the aorta. So the stroke volume will reduce, cardiac output will reduce. If you have narrowing of the aorta, it means that the resistance will increase. If you have an, an increase in resistance, blood pressure will increase. Pregnancy, preeclampsia, whereby you can have proteinuria and because of that, you know, to say in pregnancy, the blood volume will increase because the plasma volume will increase. Preeclampsia, you can have edema there taking place and then blood pressure will also increase in pregnancy because the blood volume is going to increase. And then on top of that, there's proteinuria <clears throat> that will also result into an increase in blood volume. Then stress, the sympathetic activation, vessel constriction increasing total peripheral resistance and also resulting into venal constriction, venous retainer increase, blood pressure will increase. 
Then you can also have pheochromocytomia. So this is pheochromocytomia. It's just a condition in which you have an increase in catecholamines, epinephrine or epinephrine. You will know the effect. Vasoconstriction, increasing venous retain, also increasing total peripheral resistance, hypertension. The systemic vascular resistance, if you have an increase here in case of stress, Okay, so an increase in systemic vascular resistance in case of stress, you have sympathetic activation, vasoconstriction, or those small arteries and arterioles that will increase the total peripheral resistance, blood pressure will increase. Antherosclerosis, this is abnormal deposition of fat materials in the inner wall of the blood vessels. That will also increase the pulse pressure. And sometimes you can also have arteriosclerosis, which is abnormal hardening and thickening of arteries. So thickening and hardening of arteries is called arteriosclerosis, which is different from antherosclerosis. We should be able to depreciate the two. So arteriosclerosis, old age is a factor. So as the person ages, the arteries becomes harder because you know that the arteries are as old as you are. So the older you become, the harder they become. And then blood pressure will also start increasing. And of course, there are also other uh, genes that are involved in hardening of these arteries. Other people are just more prone to hypertension because of that. Then you have the pheochromocytomia, you know, to say in pheochromocytomia, you have an increase in catecholamines that will increase total peripheral resistance. Thyroid dysfunction, if you have uh, an increase in T3, T4, in hyperthyroidism, for instance, metabolism will increase, and then also blood pressure can also increase because the heart rate can increase in hyperthyroidism. Diabetes, it has got an effect on the cardiovascular system that will result into hypertension. Cerebral ischemia also, if you have damage to the brain cells, you can have misfiring of action potentials that can bring about <clears throat> a sympathetic stimulation and other factors that will increase the hypertension. Okay, so with this information, I think uh, I'm going to end my class here, but you know to say there are also other factors that can result into hypertension, for instance, obesity. These are the risk factors. So these risk factors will increase <clears throat> hypertension cases. So for instance, obesity, inactivity, if you don't do exercises, we're more prone to hypertension. Alcohol, drinking of this alcohol, Genetics, you're talking of genes, certain genes, certain families, they're just more prone to hypertension. You find that you, your father was hypertensive, your grandfather was hypertensive, you are also hypertensive. You're talking of the genetics. It's just in your genetic makeup that you, you are more prone to hypertension. Smoking, there are certain components within the smoke that can result into hypertension. Remember, within the, the smoke, you have nicotine. You have also other factors that will have an effect on the cardiovascular system low potassium, calcium, magnesium levels can be more prone to hypertension. Stress, the sympathetic stimulation, increasing total peripheral resistance, blood pressure will shoot up. Then also intake of salt. So the person needs to be regulating the intake of salt. Don't put a lot of salts. I, I, I know there is also a correlation between alcohol and salt intake because most of the people that consume alcohol, you find that they, they like salt because their test receptors are compromised because of this alcohol. So you find that their sensitivity to salt reduces. So they'll start consuming a lot of salt. Then they'll be more prone to hypertension. Okay, so salt is not very good because that can also result into hypertension. Okay, so this table is just summarizing the hypertension and hypertension. So 
you're just looking at the symptoms, the causes, the risk factors, prevention. So at your own time, you can look at this um, in relationship of hypertension and hypertension, of comparing hypertension and hypotension, high blood pressure, low blood pressure. Okay, with that information, this is where I'm going to end this class. There's been too much of information, but I hope you'll be able to understand. So if you still have questions, when we have interactive lectures, you should be able to ask those questions. Thank you very much for your time.